Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Art of Climate Modeling. In today's lecture, we'll be continuing our discussion on parameterizations for global climate modeling systems. Last time, we talked about the scales of parameterization, parameterizing turbulence, and parameterizing convection and clouds. In today's lecture, we'll be talking about parameterizing microphysics, parameterizing radiation, and evaluating and tuning parameterizations. We return briefly to this flowchart showing a typical CAM time step, which includes the many parameterizations employed in a typical atmospheric model. Recall that parameterizations can be broadly put into two categories, those that are needed to represent processes and features below the truncation scale of the grid, and those that represent processes beyond atmospheric dynamics. The former include turbulence, convection, and macrophysics, and include parameters that need to be adjusted depending on the grid scale. The latter are the focus of this lecture. Among those parameterizations that are always on, the first we'll discuss today is the microphysics parameterization. In a global modeling system, microphysics is responsible for defining the water species in the atmospheric model and the phase transitions between different water species. Some microphysics parameterizations also use information from transported aerosols, which act as cloud condensation nuclei for cloud droplets. Perhaps the simplest microphysics scheme would work as follows. Water vapor is transported through the atmosphere via the dynamics. When the dynamics causes the relative humidity of a grid cell to exceed 100%, the water vapor condenses to form liquid water. In our simple parameterization, we will simply assume liquid water will instantaneously fall out of the atmosphere and deposit on the surface. Condensation also releases latent heat, producing a local warming in the grid cell. We will assume that this process takes place at constant pressure in order to preserve conservation of mass in a vertical pressure coordinate model, even though this is not really a constant pressure process in reality. If we define the rate of loss of water vapor as capital C, then the amount of heating due to condensation is equal to L over Cp times C. Here L is the latent heat of vaporization of water, a constant, and Cp is the specific heat capacity of dry air at constant pressure. These coefficients quantify the amount of heat released when the water condenses, and how much of a temperature change that induces in the surrounding air. Condensation occurs whenever the specific humidity exceeds the saturation specific humidity, which is the function of temperature and pressure at the bottom of this slide. For simplicity, we will assume that the condensation process occurs instantaneously. This means that the specific humidity and temperature will experience an instantaneous adjustment whenever the parameterization is evaluated. We will denote this adjustment by delta Q and delta T. Note that delta Q is always negative and delta T is always positive. From the last slide, we have that delta T is a function of delta Q via the relationship shown here. More condensation corresponds to more warming. Note that since pressure is unchanging, it is held constant through this process. However, the saturation specific humidity must be evaluated at the final temperature of the system since we want the specific humidity to be equal to QSAT after the parameterization is called. To solve the nonlinear equations in this system, we can approximate the change in saturation specific humidity over the time step as the derivative of QSAT with respect to temperature multiplied by the temperature change. Plugging this into our earlier equation and solving then yields the three equations for the updated temperature, water vapor, and condensation rate shown here. This concludes our simple microphysics parameterization. More advanced forms of microphysics can incorporate multiple water species, which are individually tracked around by the die core, or involve criteria for condensation that depend on the subgrid scale structure of the grid cell. Kessler microphysics, documented in Kessler's 1969 paper, involves water vapor, cloud water, and rainwater. All three species can be transported around by the dynamical core. More advanced equations are included for condensation and evaporation, enabling water vapor to equilibrate with cloud water. Cloud water can convert to rainwater, which can in turn either evaporate or produce precipitation. Precipitation then falls out of the atmosphere at the fall velocity which is a function of the environmental profile. Kessler microphysics, already far advanced from our simple microphysics scheme, is still considered to be a fairly primitive parameterization. 
More modern schemes generally incorporate five or more water species, including both liquid and frozen species. Additionally, these schemes incorporate interactions with aerosol species, which are used as cloud condensation nuclei. These schemes also predict cloud processes such as droplet nucleation, condensation, evaporation, collision coalescence, sedimentation, ice crystal nucleation, deposition, sublimation, rimming, and melting. The equations that describe transitions between species usually incorporate a mix of theory and empirical tuning. More complex microphysics schemes can be classified into bulk microphysics schemes, which tend to be the most commonly employed, bin microphysics schemes, and super droplet microphysics schemes, which are rare. Among bulk microphysics schemes, there are single moment, double moment, and triple moment schemes. The single moment schemes predict only the mass mixing ratio of each hydrometeor species, but have been shown to have severe deficiencies in correctly modeling cloud microphysics. Double moment schemes additionally predict the number concentration of each hydrometeor species while triple moment schemes also predict radar reflectivity factor for each hydrometeor species. Nonetheless, all of these schemes basically represent a way of dealing with the same problem. Not all cloud droplets, rain droplets, or ice crystals are the same size. CAM-6 uses Morrison-Gettleman II microphysics, a two-moment bulk microphysics scheme described in the paper by Gettleman and Morrison 2015. It improves upon MG microphysics, which was employed up through CAM-5 with the addition of prognostic rain and snow. This means that rain and snow are actually tracked by the dynamical core, while in previous versions, the rain and snow were assumed to fall out to the surface instantaneously. As a consequence, there were substantial improvements in the treatment of precipitation in rugged regions, where the MG scheme had overestimated precipitation along the windward side of mountains and underestimated it along the leeward flank. Let's now turn our attention to the radiation parameterization, which is designed to capture the effects of solar and terrestrial radiation. Six key processes need to be accounted for by the radiation parameterization. First, we need to account for emission of terrestrial radiation from either the atmosphere or the surface. Then, as the photon travels through the atmosphere, whether it originates from the sun or from the earth, it can be scattered by the atmosphere, absorbed by the atmosphere, reflected by the surface, or absorbed by the surface. Scattering refers to the process by which a photon, on interacting with a molecule or particle, changes direction. Scattering can be in essentially any direction, and is the process responsible for blue skies during the day and red skies in the evening. Absorption refers to the process by which a photon, on interacting with a molecule or particle, is absorbed and increases the internal energy of that molecule or particle. Importantly, each type of molecule can only absor absorb certain wavelengths of light. Emission refers to the process by which an excited atom or molecule will spontaneously emit a photon and in the process drop to a lower energy state. Again, emission can only occur for select wavelengths of light. The sensitivity of different chemical constituents to different wavelengths of radiation is captured in this figure. Clearly, there are substantial differences across chemical species and wavelengths. Thus, to determine how radiation is affected by the gaseous composition of the grid cell and whether or not there is absorption or emission, we need to know the composition of air within that cell. Some atmospheric gases can be approximated as well mixed, meaning that their density within a grid cell is equal to a single global scalar times the local air density. However, for species such as water vapor, the mixing ratio varies substantially by latitude and altitude and so its influence on radiation must be modeled explicitly. Additionally, radiative interaction with the various phases of water, cloud droplets or rain droplets of various sizes, can further complicate radiative interactions with the atmosphere. This selective sensitivity of the different chemical constituents of the atmosphere to the wavelength of the radiation is a big reason why radiation is so difficult to model both quickly and accurately. Since it's impossible to model the whole continuum of wavelengths, radiation parameterizations use a discretization in wavelength space that enables them to only evaluate interactions at a few select wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. For simplicity, radiation is broken up into shortwave radiation, primarily from downwelling solar radiation, and longwave radiation. 
A single photon can undergo many interactions before it either impacts the surface or is sent back to space. However, for simplicity, most radiative parameterizations use the single scattering approximation, which assumes that shortwave photons can be reflected at most once as they travel through the atmosphere. When the photon reaches the surface of the planet, its probability of reflection is computed based on the albedo of the surface, which is a function of the surface type. Reflection of shortwave radiation by the surface contributes to outgoing shortwave radiation, while emission of radiation from the surface contributes to outgoing longwave radiation. Radiation parameterization calculations are generally performed within each grid column separately. This simplifies matters since we do not need to account for lateral exchange of photons. Then, for each wavelength, we only need to compute the radiative flux between each discrete layer of the grid. Given that they are strongly connected, upward and downward fluxes are solved as a unified system. The equation governing the radiative parameterization comes directly from the science of radiative transfer. In this equation, the intensity of radiation is in a particular wavelength is computed as a function of the optical depth tau and the cosine of the incident angle, denoted mu. The right-hand side consists of terms representing the absorption or extinction of radiation as it passes through the atmosphere, diffusive scattering, single scattering, and blackbody emission. Here, omega denotes the single, single scattering albedo, which is a measure of the probability of radiation scattering at a particular wavelength, while S0 denotes the intensity of solar radiation. The function P here is the phase function, which represents the probability of scattering at a given angle for a given incident angle. The diffusive scattering term is perhaps the most complex, accounting for scattering of radiation from any possible direction, and consisting of an integral over all possible incident angles. This term is difficult to compute, and so is either simplified or neglected completely, as in the case of the single scattering approximation. Further simplifications are often introduced to this equation so as to separate the intensity function, which is nominally a function of both mu and tau, into only a few functions of tau alone. The Eddington method, for instance, assumes that the intensity is linear in mu, and so can be written as the sum of i0 and i1 times mu. This is also known as the two-stream approximation, since we can interpret the intensity as consisting of an upwelling and downwelling intensity. The delta Eddington method further simplifies the equation above by approximating the phase function as a combination of a delta function and a smooth phase function over all other angles. This indicates that the photon will scatter forward with probability f and at other angles with probability 1 minus f. The most widely employed radiative transfer parameterization for GCMs, and in particular CAM, is RRTMG which stands for the Rapid Radiative Transfer Model for GCMs. In the long wave regime, it includes 140 evaluation points, that is, wavelengths at which the radiative transfer calculation is performed, over 16 spectral bands. In the short wave regime, it includes 112 evaluation points over 14 spectral bands. It calculates radiative interactions with ozone, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, oxygen, and halocarbons. It also accounts for Rayleigh scattering and radiation aerosol interactions. Shortwave radiation is handled via the Delta Eddington method two-stream approximation within each layer with a single scattering approximation. Longwave radiation completely neglects scattering, which only introduces around 1-2% to error in the longwave radiation calculation. More information on the RRTMG scheme can be found at the link here. One issue we haven't yet discussed is how radiation deals with clouds. Clouds are highly reflective surfaces at many wavelengths, and so their bulk reflectivity is accounted for in the radiation scheme. However, given that clouds are macroscopic objects which are found at the subgrid scale, radiation parameterizations must also account for the effects of cloud overlap. When clouds exist at multiple layers, there are questions of how much shadow higher clouds cast on those clouds that are down below. This can have a substantial impact on estimates of how much radiation reaches the ground, and so complex schemes have been developed to estimate cloud overlap. The simplest schemes assume either minimum or maximum overlap between clouds. In the diagram on the right, this can result in either total cloud fractions of 0.9 or 0.6 respectively. 
However, radiation parameterizations have some freedom in how they choose to implement this phenomenon. In CAM, dynamics and radiation are generally the biggest contributors to the total model runtime, with radiation taking up to 50% of the total execution time. To reduce the computational cost, radiation can be computed less frequently than other physics parameterizations, typically once every model hour. More information on the specifics of the radiation implementation in CAM can be found at the link here. All right, that wraps up our discussion on specific parameterizations found in CAM. Hopefully you have a good feel for the kind of mechanics that goes on under the hood of each of these schemes. Let's now turn our attention to understanding how parameterizations may be evaluated to determine if they are representative of real-world processes. In general, three types of simulations are used to evaluate parameterizations and ensure their behavior is consistent with our physical understanding of the process. The most straightforward route for parameterization evaluation is through full climate runs. However, alternate strategies include forecast runs and single column model runs. We'll look at these in detail now. Climate model runs typically require us to execute CAM for multiple years, either in AMIP mode or in coupled mode. The climatology produced through this run is then compared with gridded observational products to validate model performance. Simulations conducted in this manner need to be for a sufficiently long period of time to ensure we have a good sam sampling of the probability distribution at each grid point. Given differences in seasonality and differences over land and ocean, this can require several simulated years or decades. While one year may be enough to have a quick look at global means and ensure the model roughly satisfies radiative balance at the top of the atmosphere, because of more slow-lived processes, five years are needed to examine tropical variability, and ten years are needed to capture polar variability. However, this also means that the parameterization suite is validated in the same framework as it is intended to be used. Another key limitation of this approach is that the resulting simulations depend on all aspects of the model, including the dynamics, parameterizations, and do incorporate any feedbacks that may exist in the model. This makes it very difficult to isolate the cause of model biases or errors. The plots on the left here show precipitation amounts from an annual 10-year climatology versus GPCP measurements. Close examination of regions where precipitation is over or underestimated may point to biases in the suite of parameterizations employed. Climate runs may either be performed with or without an active ocean. If no ocean model is used, we can run an atmospheric model into comparison project or AMIP mode, which is a standard protocol for testing GCMs without an ocean. Under this configuration, the GCM is constrained by realistic sea surface temperatures and the run conducted from 1979 to 2005, or some other appropriate time period. In order to reduce the duration of the simulation, we can also run with climatological sea surface temperatures, which do not update the sea surface temperatures in time. Because we need to account for fewer sources of variability, these kind of simulations enable a comprehensive statistical sample of the atmosphere in less wall time. We can simplify things further by removing surface topography entirely and employing zonally symmetric sea surface temperatures, producing an aquaplanet type simulation. On the other end of the spectrum, typical fully coupled model simulations, which employ an active ocean and ice model, include PI control and historical runs. The former refers to control simulations with pre-industrial CO2 levels in the atmosphere, while the latter refers to a simulation of a historical period with gradually increasing CO2 levels. These plots show some examples of what we might see when comparing temperature anomalies in simulations conducted between 1850 and 2005, and when using CAM4 versus CAM5. Observed global temperatures are shown in black and provide a basis for assessment of our simulations. These types of simulations can be used to examine climate sensitivity, that is, how temperatures respond to increased carbon dioxide concentrations, climate feedback, and direct or indirect aerosol effects. Forecast runs involve running short simulations of 5 to 14 days to determine how skillful the model is at reproducing the observed weather over short timescales. While this doesn't capture long-term modes of variability that can contaminate longer climate runs, these runs are nonetheless useful at identifying problems that may exist in the coupled model on short timescales. 
In forecast runs, we assume that if the atmosphere is initialized realistically, errors will primarily come from parameterization deficiencies. Because of the relatively low cost of these runs, we can also run multiple ensembles with different parameterization sets or with slightly modified parameterization tuning factors. However, if we are using a benchmark against observed weather over a short period, the accuracy of the initial state can play a big role in the overall error from the model. Finally, given that parameterizations are only employed within single columns, it makes sense that we should be able to perform simulations with only single columns. In this case, most terms in the dynamical equations are prescribed, including horizontal advective tendencies, vertical velocity, and surface boundary conditions. In some cases, these data are corresponding evaluation data and readily available and of high quality such as in the case of deployments under the U.S. Department of Energy Advanced Radiation Measurement, or ARM program. These simulations are incredibly inexpensive, as only one column is being run instead of thousands or millions, as in the case of a global atmospheric model. These simulations also remove complications from feedbacks between physics and dynamics. However, there are limitations to this approach as well, including a need for the observational data to be very accurate to avoid growing errors and an inability of these methods to detect problems in feedback processes. Hand-in-hand -hand with parameterization evaluation is parameterization tuning. We've already seen through the course of this lecture that individual parameterizations have a number of parameters which can be adjusted to modify the behavior within individual columns. The tuning process involves considering different combinations of these parameters in order to ensure that individual parameterizations are behaving in line with reality. Tuning parameters are largely a product of the statistical or empirical nature of parameterizations. A list of resolution-dependent tuning parameters in CAM4 are shown in this table, along with the values selected for these parameters at 1 degree and 2 degree grid spacing in the finite volume dynamical core. Many of these tuning parameters come from the microphysics scheme in the model, including thresholds for autoconversion, precipitation evaporation efficiency, pre precipitation production efficiency, and Stokes ice sedimentation fall speed. Others come from the convective and cloud parameterization, including the relative humidity threshold for stable clouds at low and high levels, and parameters controlling shallow and deep cloud fraction. These are not physical parameters, but again, are a product of the approximations and assumptions employed in the parameterization. In CAM5, the number of tuning knobs has increased to over 20 as more complex parameterizations have been added. The tuning process, that is, the selection of reasonable values of these parameters, is a fundamental element of any discrete approximation. These parameterizations need to be tuned to ensure that the subgrid scale is correctly responding to the model environment, which includes any biases in the environmental state because of the discretization process. Given how the assumptions about the variability of the subgrid is dependent on the scale of individual grid cells, parameters need to be modified as resolution changes. This is a difficult challenge in the horizontal, but an even bigger challenge when it comes to vertical grid spacing. The development of scale-aware parameterizations offers some promise of reducing the number of tuning parameters, but development of these schemes is an ongoing challenge. In general, when tuning is performed, historical observations are employed as guidance for these parameters, meaning that there is inevitably some danger of the parameterization not responding correctly into the future. When performing tuning, it's common to focus on a small set of favorite variables. Common choices include top of the atmosphere radiative balance, short wave cloud forcing, long wave cloud forcing, precipitable water, and precipitation. For each of these diagnostics, we can compare to a favorite observational or reanalysis data product, which is the target of our tuning exercise. The goal is then to determine a set of tuning parameters such that our model outputs match most closely with those of the observational data set. What makes this process difficult is the need to complete it with an infinitesimal fraction of the number of climate runs needed for a comprehensive study. To illustrate, if we assume there are 20 tuning parameters with three values each, trying out every possible combination would require over 3 billion simulations. 
Thus, the tuning process requires a healthy dose of expert knowledge to select only a small subset of possible runs. To limit the human involvement in the tuning process and ensure the model is physically grounded, it's common to limit the number of variables tuned. As a consequence, the most common strategy for tuning simply focuses on ensuring the model's outgoing longwave radiation is matched by the absorbed solar radiation. This means that when the model is run under a stationary climate, such as pre-industrial, there are no significant drifts in the average global temperatures. If tuned in this manner, we can be confident that the model is able to maintain a stable climate state given constant background forcing. The plot here shows zonal mean solar and outgoing radiation as a function of latitude. Given that radiative balance is heavily modulated by moist processes and cloud fraction, this is a natural context to target for our tuning. Okay, that wraps up our discussion on model parameterizations. Hopefully you've picked up some insights into the kinds of decisions that need to be made to correctly capture subgrid scale processes in our models. In the next lecture, we'll keep up the theme of evaluation by discussing a hierarchy for total model evaluation.